see if people are, there we go, we have some attendees now. Hi everybody. Thank you so much for joining. Uh, we apologize for the wait. Um, uh, we had a bit of trouble getting started with technology. It's super fun with technology, right? So thank you again so much for waiting and uh, we will begin. I'm going to quickly uh, give a thank you to our sponsor here, uh, Malincroft Pharmaceuticals. Uh, thanks to their support, we're able to present this webinar. And we're here today with um, uh, Sydney Axelrod. Um, she is Hopefully you're seeing that now, and I'm going to turn it over to her, um, and we'll go from there. Go ahead, Sydney. Okay, great. Um, thank you so much for having me. Um, it's really nice to be here with everyone. My name is Sydney. I'm a dietitian in New York City. I have a private practice, Axelrod Nutrition, and then I am the dietitian at the Mount Sinai National Jewish Health Respiratory Institute. Um, and it's just really good to be here. So I'm glad everyone's here and we can get started. Um, so, you know, today we're working with the sarcoidosis population. We can go to the next slide too. You know, I know everyone here is very familiar with sarcoidosis, but it is an inflammatory disease characterized by the formation of granulomas, which are tiny clumps of inflammatory cells in one or more organs. And this chronic inflammation can end up interfering with organ structure or function. And if it goes unchecked for a long time can lead to permanent scarring and it can affect any organ, you know, often the skin or the eyes, the heart, the salivary glands, but in 90% of cases it is affecting the lungs, which is why I see a lot of it at the Respiratory Institute. So the prevalence in the US, there's about 150,000 to 200,000 cases and worldwide there's 1.2 million people who are affected by sarcoidosis. Um, most of the people are between 20 and 40 years old. And in the US, it's predominantly African-American or people of Scandinavian descent. Next slide. Um, so the signs and symptoms, I'm sure you guys are very familiar, but it can, you know, the first signs can be fever or enlarged lymph nodes, swelling, and then because it's often in the lungs, it could be shortness of breath, chronic cough, wheezing, um, and the most common treatment, well, fortunately, a lot of people don't require treatment, but if they do, the goal is to prevent organ damage and relieve symptoms and improve quality of life. And often this means corticosteroids. Next slide. So we're gonna focus a lot today on corticosteroids. Um, like I said, they are the first line of defense when it comes to sarcoidosis. Treatment can often last many months, but the goal is to decrease the dose and hopefully eventually wean people off. Corticosteroids are man-made drugs that are closely resemble cortisol, which is the flight for fright or flight hormone in the body. It's produced by the adrenal glands and it's involved in immune function, the inflammatory response, blood pressure regulation, glucose metabolism, and insulin release. So given its function in the body, it's not surprising then that a lot of the side effects are related to those functions. So increased appetite, weight gain, and redistribution of fat, um, fluid retention and hypertension, hyperglycemia and osteoporosis. So there are other side effects like um, mood swings or insomnia, but we're gonna focus on the nutritionally relevant side effects today. Um, they, they depend on the dose and the duration of treatment, but some of them can happen very, very quickly and with very low doses. And in the US, prednisone is the most common um, corticosteroid. Next slide. So if you've been on steroids, you probably noticed that you are suddenly ravenous. It actually increases your appetite. So the weight gain that's associated with steroid use is related to both increased caloric intake from your increased appetite and also fluid retention. Um, Cushing syndrome, which is a redistribution of the fat in your body is also really common. So not only do you gain weight, but you tend to gain it in specific areas. Maybe you guys are familiar with the term moon face. So that's like just in your face and like the buffalo hump on the back of your neck. And then a lot of people complain about abdominal fat. 
And these are side effects that tend to show up very early in treatment. So some of the first things that you may notice. Next slide. So in terms of managing weight, these are my, these are my tips. Really focus on low calorie foods that can prevent serious weight gain. But the best thing you could do is plan ahead and be prepared. So set yourself up for success. So that means stocking your fridge or your pantry with healthy, nutritious foods and avoiding keeping trigger foods in your house. So if, you know, if you have a bag of potato chips and you're gonna eat the whole thing, then just don't keep them in the house. The other thing you could do in your fridge or pantry is put your healthiest choices at eye level. So that's what you're gonna see first. And that's what you're gonna to go to first. And then put like the snacky foods either very high up or very low, or you can put them in opaque containers because if you can't see it, you generally don't go for it. So that's one way. Um, you should also eat small frequent meals of high nutritional value. So what that means is that you have small volume, but you get a lot of bang for your buck. Focus on fiber and protein. This is gonna keep you full between meals and suppress your appetite. And it's just like avoiding calories that don't do much for you. So that's what it means to be like a high nutritional value. So you could get the same calories from an apple and peanut butter as you could get from like a bag of Fritos, but you're getting so much more nutrition from an apple and peanut butter. So that's why that's what you would wanna be choosing. Um, in terms of weight management, I would generally su suggest a high protein and low net carb diet, especially with steroid use because of the effect on your glycemic control. So low net carb, it means that it's the, carb, the total carbohydrate content minus the fiber. So we wanna choose carbohydrates that are very high in fiber. So that would be fruits and vegetables, whole grains, and basically the fiber is gonna keep you full. So you're less likely to binge later or snack later. And it's really good for your heart health. It's really good for your gut. It helps you have regular bowel movements. Those are the kind of carbohydrates we want, to go, we want you to have. And then the lean protein that's good for your muscles. And also it's a slow, it's, it takes longer to digest. So you should be feeling full if you're eating protein. <clears throat> Um, I also want you to limit added sugars and saturated fat. I think the easiest thing in terms of eliminating added sugars is to avoid calories in your drinks. So that would be regular soda, regular juice, regular lemonade or Snapple, anything like that, and then desserts. Um, and saturated fat, so fat, in terms of your nutrients, fat gives you the most calories. So one gram of fat is nine calories but one gram of protein or carbohydrate is only four calories. So if you reduce your fat intake, you're gonna reduce your caloric intake and especially saturated fat. We just know that that's, you know, it's not good for your heart. So if we're gonna have fat, we want it to be unsaturated, but really we want you to watch how much you're having. Another serious tip is to drink plenty of water throughout the day. So a lot of the time we are mistaking thirst for hunger. So we end up eating even though we're really thirsty. So, you know, if you just had a meal and you think you're hungry, then why don't you try drinking a glass of water and see if that sort of curbs your hunger? Because as long as we're staying hydrated, our meals should be filling enough that we're not snacking so much between meals. Um, and then there's mindfulness and mindfulness I think is, is, is really difficult, but it's what's gonna be the best for helping you manage your weight if you're on steroids. Um, mindfulness mean, means listening to your body and listening to your hunger and satiety cues. So hunger is different than appetite. Hunger is physical, like you physically feel hungry and appetite is that you feel like eating. So you really need to figure out which one it is that you're feeling. If you're hungry, eat. But if you just have an appetite, then maybe you need to go for a walk or get involved in a book or you know phone a friend, whatever it is. Um, 
it's also important <clears throat> that to notice like when you've had enough to eat, stop eating. So you wanna quit before you feel full or stuffed or like sick from overeating. And often that means slowing down, putting your fork down between bites. Um, I usually encourage people to have you know, 75% of their plate and then take a break and then, you know, check back, really see if you need that last quarter because often we don't. Um, another thing with mindfulness is, you know, you could, you should, you should be eating with utensils off a plate, like sitting down at the table and really make that the primary thing that you're doing. So you're not also watching TV and then mindlessly just finishing an entire bag of potato chips, even though you know you, you really wanna be portioning them out first. Um, also, you can remove your plate when you're done eating. So you're less inclined to just you know, be part of the clean plate club. And then last but not least, and very important with this population especially, is to try to get some exercise. I would say at least 30 minutes, three times a week, ideally more than that, but you know whatever you can do. And those tips in general should help you manage your weight. Okay, um, we can go to the next slide. <clears throat> so I'm sure you've also noticed this. It's one of the other early side effects of um, steroid treatment, but steroids promote fluid retention and they can cause or worsen high blood pressure. Um, like I said before, the weight gain that we experience with steroid treatment is related to both increased intake and then also fluid retention. This is a really common complaint I see with my patients. What you wanna do is reduce the amount of sodium in your diet. So when you eat sodium, you hold on to water. You guys have probably felt it before if you've ever ordered Chinese food or gone out and had like a very salty meal, then maybe your rings are tight or you have like indentations on your legs from your pants. It's the sodium, okay? So if you don't have high blood pressure, I want you having less than 2000 milligrams a day. If you already do have high blood pressure, less than 1500. What this means is to choose foods that have 140 grams, excuse me, milligrams of sodium per serving, okay? So that's why we have this nutrition label right here. The sodium's always listed, but I want you guys to be really careful with the serving size because, because the serving sizes, they can be deceptive. So if you want, you know, just make sure that you're really only having 140 grams in whatever it is that you're eating, okay? Another thing you could do is just eat more fresh foods, you know, fresh fruits and vegetables. They may have some sodium, but not a lot. Generally, anything that doesn't have a nutrition label is what I want you to be eating. Um, avoid processed, canned, and packaged foods, even though some of them say, excuse me, that they're low sodium, sometimes the marketing can be very confusing. So really look at the label and then as much as you can, just avoid it. Um, don't add extra salt at the table and you can add flavor without salt. So you can try lemon juice or vinegar or herbs, and then just be extra careful at restaurants. You can get sauces or dressing on the side. And another way to help your, you know, help with fluid retention is to eat a diet that's very high in potassium. So potassium can decrease sodium levels and because it increases your urinary outputs, you can get rid of fluid. So the best sources of, of potassium would be bananas, oranges, potatoes, broccoli, tomatoes, raisins, squash, and prunes. Um, the next slide. Hyperglycemia. So um, steroids are the main cause of drug-induced hyperglycemia. Hyperglycemia is high blood sugar and sometimes this can result in new onset diabetes for people who didn't have diabetes before. And then you start taking steroids and suddenly you're considered diabetic. So, you know, you're at increased risk just by taking the steroid. And then if you have a family history or 
the older you are, or if you're overweight, and then if you have a history of gestational diabetes, all of these put you at even higher risk for developing diabetes. The good thing is that once you stop taking steroids, this tends to resolve, but basically you could have higher fasting glucose levels, higher glucose levels after a meal, and you could develop insulin resistance. Um, next slide. So the good news is that you can manage your blood sugar with your diet. And you can do a good job managing your blood sugar. Um, that means eating a healthy and balanced diet. So carbohydrates are the food that affect your blood sugar. Carbohydrates are grains, fruits, vegetables, dairy products, sweets, desserts, stuff like that. So you'll notice um, the image here shows you complex carbs versus simple carbs. So the, for me, the easiest way to think about a complex carb is that it's the way it comes out of the ground or off of a tree, you know? So you'll see the sweet potato and then the simple carb would be the French fry because now this has been processed. So as much as you can, you wanna stick to the real thing. Complex carbs, they just don't have the same spike on your blood sugar and they're usually packed with fiber other vitamins and minerals, um, and they're complex as opposed to simple. So the glycemic load is much smaller. In general, you're, you should be limiting your carbohydrates to one fourth of your plate. And we're gonna go over my plate, I think a little bit later. Another thing is whenever you're eating carbohydrate, you should also be having protein and fat. This is just more of a complete meal and the sugar, it's not gonna cause like the spike in your blood sugar the way just eating a carbohydrate would. Um, you also wanna eat regular meals and avoid skipping meals. This is gonna, you know, you just wanna be smooth sailing. So if you're skipping meals, you're gonna drop. And then when you eat, you're gonna spike. So you just wanna have regularly timed meals. Um, and then get regular physical activity because physical activity can actually increase insulin sensitivity. Okay, um, okay, osteoporosis. So long-term, so this would be like a later complication with steroids, but it can lead to osteoporosis, which is the loss of bone density and increase your risk for fractures. Now, this is sort of a, a tricky one with sarcoidosis just because of the calcium situation. So. Roughly 10% of sarcoidosis patients experience hypercalcemia or hypercalcemia, which is high levels of calcium in their urine or blood. And if this applies to you, I would encourage you to talk to your doctor about supplementation because it, it just gets a little complicated. In general, I would want everyone to get enough calcium and vitamin D from their diet to help combat like the risks of developing osteoporosis. Another thing would be to get enough protein in your diet. This is just good for strong bones. Um, it's about 0.5 grams um, per pound of body weight, really a little bit less than that. So if you weigh 150 pounds, it's like, I want you to get 70 grams of protein a day. Um, exercise, <laughs> this is both weight bearing and resistance training. And then there's some lifestyle things that you should do. So don't smoke, limit your alcohol and caffeine intake. And this is the best way to combat osteoporosis. There are also medications that you could take, but this would be something for you to talk to your doctor about. Um, and then in general, aside from like the known side effects of corticosteroids, I personally think that this is the best diet for sarcoidosis patients, the anti-inflammatory diet. So certain eating patterns can lower the levels of inflammation in the body. And as we know, this is an inflammatory disease. Um, the focus should be on whole unprocessed foods shared with friends and family and whole foods, like I said before, is you know as it came out of the ground. So the baked potato versus the French fries. Um, focus on fruits, vegetables, and whole grains. And here it's really important to choose a variety of colors. The more colors you have, the more vitamins, minerals, phytochemicals, and they all have different antioxidant properties. You just 
you just need to have a lot of variety, like eat the rainbow is really the saying. Um, you know, nuts, seeds, and olive oils are the best sources of fat. For protein, you wanna do mostly fish and shellfish, though you can have moderate amounts of white meat, eggs, fermented dairy. Limit your intake of red meats and sweets. I know like you've all heard this before. Um, so this diet, it's very high in fiber, it's high in omega-3 fatty acids. And then there's a lifestyle approach, you know, be active, get enough sleep, manage your stress, limit alcohol intake and don't smoke. Um, so those are really the keys, I think, to eat, living a healthy lifestyle with sarcoidosis and just in general. And then we, we had some questions that everyone sent in so I just wanted, I guess we'll go over those. And then I think we have time for some live Q and A. Yeah, so let me grab those questions for you guys. I have to actually get out of that and do that show so I can get out of there. Um, thank you, Sydney, that was really great. Um, let me get to the questions. Ah, oh, here we go. All right, so folks, and again, I apologize. So there's some confusion. Uh, there doesn't seem to be a Q&A option. It's on my screen, but it's not on anyone else's. So uh, please do continue to go ahead and put questions into the chat. Um, again, we did ask folks to ask questions in advance of this um, event so that we could um, uh, get some of these questions queued up. Actually, I have to find them now. I had them. Um, and... Uh, I have them too, if you want me to start. Oh, I'll, I got them now. <laughs> All right, so our first question is, um, what is the best diet to follow? Um, what are the best anti-inflammatory foods and can one diet limit or stop episodes or flares? Right, so this is sort of what we just finished on. Um, and this was the most common question that we got. There isn't one specific diet, but in general, I think, an anti-inflammatory diet, which is the closest to the Mediterranean diet is the best option. The Mediterranean diet um, is linked to lower overall levels of inflammation and it's considered protective against many chronic health conditions, including cardiovascular disease, type two diabetes, Alzheimer's and Parkinson's, and then certain cancers. Um, in general, this is the healthiest way of eating, in my opinion, and in the opinion of many other registered dietitians. It's it's plant-based, not exclusively plant, so there's room for animal products. Um, it's rich in fruits and vegetables and whole grains and legumes. It emphasizes nuts, seeds, and olive oils, mostly fish, limited red meat, limited sweets. Um, I can't say that there's a specific food that's gonna stop a flare, but I think that this general pattern of eating can reduce inflammation and even like resolve like current ongoing inflammation. Thank you. Um, and the next question is what's the best snack for energy to avoid an afternoon slump? Well, <laughs> um, snacks are a key component of a healthy diet, I think, but not all snacks are created equal. So the key for snacking, um, especially if the goal is to avoid an afternoon slump, is to choose nutrient-dense foods rather than foods that are high in sugar. For me, the equation is protein plus fiber. So that's what's gonna, I think, get you one, energized, and two, it's gonna keep you full. So it's gonna hold you over until dinner. Um, so you should be thinking like an apple or celery with peanut butter. So you get the fiber and then you get protein and fat or a Greek yogurt with berries or pineapple and cottage cheese or you know, veggie sticks and hummus, almonds and a string cheese. That's really what you should be thinking and avoiding anything that's just a simple sugar. Thank you. That actually sounds good. I wanna eat that now. <laughs> um, and so we actually have a couple questions about calcium. So we did have a question that was a registered question. Should calcium be avoided? Um, we also have a question around um, calcium supplements seem to increase cardiac issues. 
uh, do fortified foods use the same type of calcium as supplements do? So I don't know if we could kind of combine those two questions there. We'll combine them. I'll do my best with the second one. So should calcium be avoided? It's really just case dependent. If you don't have hypercalcemia and you don't have hypercalcemia, then no, you shouldn't avoid calcium. And in fact, you should make sure you have adequate amounts in the diet because it's gonna you know, help you deal with or combat osteoporosis. Um, if you do have hypercalcemia, just talk to your doctor. And if there's a dietitian in the practice, you should probably talk to them. It's complicated in sarcoidosis. And then, can you repeat the second half of the question? Yeah, so the person was asking whether or not calcium supplements um, use, so the, the question is, calcium supplements seem to increase cardiac issues. Do fortified foods, like calcium fortified foods, mm -hmm. use the same type of calcium as calcium supplements do? I'm really not sure. I, I think, First of all, I'm, I'm not aware of a correlation between calcium supplements and cardiovascular issues. Um, so I, I really can't speak to that. And then in terms of the fortified product, I think the, and the supplement, the best thing you could do would be to look at the ingredient label. Not every supplement is the same. There's like calcium carbonate, calcium acetate. There's a lot of different types. Um, I would just say, check the ingredient label. Sorry if that's not super helpful. I'm just not so positive. That's okay. Um, I guess we're still on calcium. Actually, there's another question around um, what's the best type of milk to drink? And is it true that a person with sarcoidosis um, cannot drink milk even if it's 2%? So again, we're <laughs> it's the calcium issue. If you have a calcium issue, you should talk to your doctor. If you don't, then milk is generally a good source of calcium and vitamin D. Um, what's the best type to drink? It's really up to you, you know? It, it's, it's what you like and what you tolerate. So cow's milk is the best source of protein in terms, you know, you get eight grams of protein and it's a really good source of calcium and vitamin D, but it contains lactose. So if you're lactose sensitive, you should be finding an alternative. Um, soy milk is probably the closest thing to cow's milk in terms of protein content. It has about seven grams of protein per cup um, and it contains essential amino acids and it's usually fortified with calcium. Almond milk is a good choice for those who are watching their calories. Um, it's usually low in sugar, but it's also low in protein. And then oat milk is like, newly popular. It's a good plant-based alternative. It's very high in fiber, which I like, um, but it's also higher in carbohydrate and actually higher in natural sugars. It's a natural sugar, but it's higher in sugar. Um, coconut milk is another option for those with either dairy or nut allergies. It's, it's kind of tricky. It's like low calorie, but it's very high in saturated fat. So and it's very flavorful. So I don't really think it's the best milk substitute. Um, really, it's up to you what you like and what you can tolerate. None of them are gonna be, or they shouldn't be a big enough part of your diet that like they're making a huge, huge difference. But with your cereal or in your coffee, whatever you like the best, my personal preference is unsweetened vanilla almond milk but it's low in calories and carbohydrate and high in calcium. So that's what I think. Thank you. I'm a fan of almond milk too. Um, okay, so we do have a question around, we actually got this in the chat as well around, um, how can I help my partner put on weight and build strength? Um, so in terms of putting on weight, it's really like a simple math equation. Calories in have to be bigger than calories out. So what we say is that it takes 30, like one pound is 3,500 calories. So whatever it is that you're doing on a normal day, if you add 500 calories per day, then by the end of the week, you should gain a pound. Now, the key here is choosing high quality calories. You don't wanna necessarily be having 500 calories of you know, Fritos, but 
if you're really looking to put on muscle and gain strength, you want to be choosing extra calories that are protein. So the first thing you could do is increase your portions, so like your protein portion size at every meal. So if you're having chicken, just a little bit more fish, just a bigger portion. Um, you could also snack between meals and again, focus on protein. So it could be a Greek yogurt or an apple with peanut butter, extra peanut butter if you're trying to gain weight. <laughs> um, and then in terms of building strength, you probably have to resistance train. So the thing here, excuse me, is that if you're suddenly working out, you're burning more calories. So not only do you have to add those 500 a day, but you have to make up for whatever it is that you're burning during your workout. Thank you, that's helpful. Um, and so we, we actually have a couple of questions specifically around diet. So the first one is, should I go vegan, vegetarian? And then the other question is, um, is fasting good for weight management? I'm doing the 816 fasting. Um, is that healthy or is the anti-inflammatory diet better? Um, okay, so first we'll do, should I go vegan or vegetarian? I generally don't encourage people who aren't vegan or aren't vegetarian already to do it. You know, if you have a religious or an ethical reason for not eating animal products, then by all means, go for it. But, but if you're gonna really be vegan, like in a healthy way, you have to supplement. Eventually there's gonna be a B12 or an iron issue. It could be, you know, a long time down the road. But I think that animal products are in moderation or a healthy part of the diet. Um, that said, I think a plant-based diet with room for animal products is the way to go. Um, so it's really just like doing my plate, like half your plate should be non-starchy vegetables, a quarter of your plate should be a complex carb, and then a quarter of the plate should be a protein. So that could be tofu or beans, and then it also could be fish or eggs or chicken or meat every now and again. Um, the fasting is, okay. Intermittent fasting is, is an option for weight loss. A lot of people find it, um, find success because truthfully, if you're only allowed to eat for eight hours of the day, the chances are that you're gonna have less calories than if you were eating for 12 hours. Um, it's kind of hard to compare it to an anti-inflammatory or Mediterranean diet because one is really about a time constriction and the other is the type of food you're eating. I think for weight loss, Intermittent fasting, you may have faster results. I don't know that they're sustainable. In terms of your overall health, a Mediterranean diet, anti-inflammatory diet is better. Thank you. Um, so we're gonna, I'm gonna kind of go back to diet in a, as well. We got another question through the chat, um, specifically around, uh, can you comment on the keto diet for sarcoidosis and whether or not sugar increases inflammation? Um, sugar is linked to inflammation. So I would say having simple processed sugars, sweets, desserts, anything like that, they're inflammatory. So I would say avoid it as much as possible. In terms of the keto diet and sarcoidosis, the ketogenic diet is a diet that is really used to treat epilepsy. And in that respect, it's amazing. It's, it's, it really is amazing that you could be off anti-epileptic drugs and seizure-free by your diet. However, the ketogenic diet is very high in fat. So if you're not using it to treat epilepsy, I generally don't recommend it. I think you start to run into cardiovascular issues. That said, avoid highly processed sugars <laughs> because it is inflammatory. Thank you. And then we have a follow-up question around the gaining weight and building strength. The question actually is around um, what can you do about fatigue as opposed to strength? Fatigue. Um, can that person ex expand, I guess, um, like fatigue working out or? 
Yeah, I think that the original question, I think earlier up was around um, helping someone, helping their husband gain weight um, and combat fatigue. Uh, my, my husband just gets very, very tired at the end of the day. Patricia, I will also sort of add there that that is very, if, if, if your husband has pulmonary sarcoidosis, a lot of that may be related to the oxygen intake um, and fatigue is a very common side effect of sarcoidosis. Uh, and so maybe Sydney, we could talk about ways in which we could use different diets or foods to help um, with fatigue specifically. Um, you know, calories, it, it, it really needs energy. So having any sort of calorie should give you energy. Um, I would say what you can do is really focus on colorful foods, like lots of fresh fruits and vegetables, and just making sure that your husband is eating enough throughout the day. You know, if, if you're not eating enough, then you're probably tired. Um, in terms of specific energy boosting foods, I just think like the super colorful, like blueberries, you know, other very colorful berries. Um, dark leafy greens, and then also just getting some protein and even like some scrambled eggs and could be a snack, honestly, for someone who needs like a boost. Um, but really, I would just focus on getting enough food throughout the day, small frequent meals. Yeah, thank you. I think, I think when we're talking about fatigue, um, it is really hard with sarcoidosis because especially when you have pulmonary sarcoidosis, there's just a lot of fatigue that comes along with not having as much oxygen as you could have. And so that's sort of a side effect of that as well. And, and um, another uh, one of the attendees noted that uh, exercise will create energy. It's really hard to force yourself as a person with sarcoidosis, um, but it will help give you energy. And that we hear that a lot from the patient community. So again, Patricia, I would really encourage you to um, find ways to get your husband up even for a walk just a little bit and and um, that may help increase the energy and then supporting that with the the good foods that Cindy's talking about. Um, so what two more questions and then we're going to go into the fun cooking session. Um, and so what are good breakfast options if I don't have to cook that I don't have to cook in the morning or that I don't have time to cook in the morning? Um, I get this question all the time. <laughs> I think everyone must be rushed in the morning. Um, so, and, you know, if you don't have time to cook, but you're an egg person, there are some things you could do. Um, you could make like mini individual frittatas. So you could do that in like a cupcake baking pan. And then they're good in the fridge for a week. So you just make a little frittata and then you just put in the microwave for I don't know, 30 seconds and then you're good to go. So you get a nice warm egg dish and it took relatively no time. You would just do that like on a Sunday. Um, hard boiled eggs, if you keep them in the shell, they'll last for a full week in the fridge. So I think that's another really good option that you could also do on Sunday. Um, you know, if you're not into eggs and you need something quick, I think the easiest thing to do is yogurt and berries. So Greek yogurt with berries, granola, cereal, you know, same thing if you just want cereal. I think if you choose a whole grains like a Cheerios or Puffins or great grains, anything like that with a banana, berries, milk, that's a nutritious meal. Um, you could do oatmeal, you could do overnight oats. So if you do that the night before, you can just grab and go. Um, but I think those are some, you know, and then the other thing is you don't have to eat a breakfast food. So if, you know, you could eat whatever you want. Some people like to have pasta for breakfast. So if there's anything else, you know, you could do cold cuts and a piece of fruit, anything like that. Sorry, I'm having trouble getting off mute here. <laughs> um, okay, so our final question, um, is eating organic meat better than non-organic meat? So this, the biggest, the biggest difference between organic and non-organic is the price. So if the price, you know, you gotta do what's best for you. And I don't think any of these 
things are going to, you know, be what kills us in the end. Sorry, but the price is the biggest difference. If price is not an issue, I'd say the best you could do is buy grass fed. You know, you are what you eat. So you are whatever the cow is eating. And that would, you know, ideally you would be eating from a cow that has been, you know, free range, cage free, living on a pasture, eating grass, like not confined and in an industrial farm where they're eating a lot of like corn and soy. So in general, I think free range is the best grass fed is the best followed by organic. I just, that's, there's the labeling laws are a little bit different in terms of, you know, antibiotics and hormones and how they're raised. Um, but again, it, it's about whatever your life permits. In general, I, I personally, I would choose to spend my money on grass fed high quality animal products as opposed to organic produce. Great, thank you, Sydney. Um, I kind of lied about the last two questions. We actually do have two other questions. I'm sorry. Um, I did promise people earlier that I would get to this question. Um, the first one is around um, folks who are on Remicade type infusions have trouble with fiber. Um, and uh, there's a question about that and I need to find it. Um, <laughs> uh, oh, sorry, methotrexate. So, um, uh, what happens with meth methotrexate and or infusion? Um, fiber is an enemy and there are times when I can barely get down a cracker. Um, sometimes only toast will help. So I'm not sure. Um, and if you can expand on that a little bit about like the question around fiber, is it just that the, the infusion makes you feel sick and you're trying to figure out what you can eat or is it specifically fiber, foods with fiber in it or, you know, that's causing the problem? Um, and then um, while that, while she's adding that, um, we have a question around nightshade vegetables and whether or not they're safe for people with sarcoidosis. Um, so the nightshade thing, I think that they're safe. It's really more of a, a tolerance question. So some people either have like, I don't know if it's like itchy mouth, stuff like that, or GI distress. So if that's something you think you're experiencing, I think the best thing you could do is keep a food journal, watch what you're eating. And then if you're symptomatic, you can go back and identify the culprit. Other than that, I don't really think that there's a link between nightshades and sarcoidosis. It's really more of just an individual nightshades in, in your system. That's helpful, thank you. And Anne did clarify, so when she has, um sort of fiber foods, it causes stomach distress after um, methotrexate uh, infusions. Uh, and she notes that she can basically only process toast or bagel. Um, so I don't know if you're able to speak to that <laughs> or not. Um, you know, I think methotrexate, it could be, it's intense. It could be really intense. And I think like whatever it is that you have to do to get through it, if that's all you can tolerate, then that's what you can tolerate. Um, it's not surprising, you know, fiber does require more work from your system to break it down. It, it's, that's why it's technically good for you. You know, there's, there's fat and there's protein in it as, a pair to, as opposed to like a processed white bread. Um, if you really wanna get other forms of fiber, you could just try like very overcooked vegetables. It might not be so delicious, but nutritious. <laughs> And I think if not, you know, just try to get, try to get through the few days after the infusion. And then once you're feeling up to it, just really focus on reintroducing fiber to your diet. Thank you. Um, awesome. Okay. So guys, we are um, going to take a short break. I think Sydney, did you want to take a short break before the cooking or did you want to just go straight in? No, you know, I think I have everything here. So. Okay. Great. Then we're going to skip the break. Um, and I'm going to turn it back over to Sydney. So thank you guys so much for our questions. Um, if you have any super lingering questions, just go ahead and email them to me and um, I'll try to get them to Sydney and maybe get an answer um, or we can ask her back, which would also be fun. Um, so Sydney, I'm going to turn it over to you now for the, for the cooking fun time. Great. <laughs> um, 
So I think everyone has gotten the recipe and the ingredients ahead of time, but basically we're gonna make a spiced chicken and kale salad. Um, this is definitely gonna adhere to the guidelines of half your plate being non-starchy vegetables and then having some carbohydrate and also some protein. This is savory and there's a little bit of sweetness because of the pear. Um, it's high in protein, it's low in carbohydrate, and it's pretty easy. And I know that there was some concern about, you know, what if we don't eat chicken? You could have any protein you want on this. It could be, you know, a fish, a shrimp, anything like that, or tofu, tempeh, beans, um, you know, beyond meat, really anything you want. Um, so let me see, we have a spiced chicken and kale salad. Sorry that my back is gonna to be to you a little bit, but let me just get all of my ingredients. I've done some prep work already to make it easier. I'm sorry that I'm out of the camera. So the first thing that we wanna do is gather all of our fresh ingredients. So I have kale, I have a bell pepper, a pear, and I just wanted to wash and chop everything up already. So I've done a lot of the kale and then I have some here. I just wanna show you what I think is the easiest way to get it off the vein. You literally just hold it and then pull it right off like this. So now we have the stem off of here. And kale is a really good choice, especially for a make-ahead salad because you can dress it and it doesn't get soggy. It honestly just gets tastier. Um, kale is, as you can see, a very dark leafy green. So it's very nutritious. It's high in iron, it's high in calcium actually. Um, and it's just hearty and it lasts a long time in the fridge. And it's good for salads, it's good for soups, smoothies. I think pretty much everything. So we have some chopped kale and we're just gonna leave this in a bowl over here. And then, you know, we talk about having color. So we have a bell pepper and I've already cut it up so that it was easy for you guys, but this is another Thing. If you're someone who likes to snack while you're cooking, having a sliced pepper is a very healthy snack, very colorful, sweet, crispy, crunchy, high in vitamin C, they're really good for you. Um, and then we also have our sliced pear. So this is more crunch, it's sweetness for the salad, um, you know, a new color, so new phytochemicals. And we have all of our fresh ingredients ready to go. Okay, so now we have our marinade. So I have salsa verde. It's a green salsa. I was unable to find Fromage Blanc in the, in the supermarket, so I use Greek yogurt. Um, it's just gonna be slightly more sour but also probably lower in saturated fat. So Greek yogurt is a really good substitute for pretty much anything that it looks like, especially sour cream. Um, so I'm gonna mix these up. And I have olive oil and salt and pepper. Can everyone see or is anyone having trouble seeing? Um, I can see. Yeah. Okay, good. I'm not measuring my oil, but you get the idea. <laughs> so this is like citrusy, but also kind of sweet, um, a little sour. It's just, it's gonna go perfectly with the spices on the chicken. So we have this and we're gonna add it over my kale. And 
and just let this marinate while we do the rest of the cooking. And like I said, my favorite, honestly, my favorite thing about kale is that it can hold a dressing. So even if we don't use all of this for the salad, this will taste good tomorrow. It'll probably taste good the next day. Also, kale just is really good at that. So we will now just let this marinate. And I don't know if anyone is cooking along, but if you are, you know, no rush. I, I cheated and prepped a little bit ahead of time. Um, but here, so we're good to go. Okay, so now after this, the next thing we would wanna do is to make the breadcrumbs. So the breadcrumbs just add a really nice crunch to a salad. I think in general, one of my favorite things to think about when you talk about combining foods is combining texture. Um, this is like a way to add a crouton, you know, something like that. So I know I, I wrote in the ingredients that it was optional that you could do either half breadcrumbs or half flaxseed. I already made my breadcrumbs. So I did half breadcrumbs, like a quarter cup of breadcrumbs, a quarter cup of flaxseed and a quarter cup of Parmesan. So I just toasted the breadcrumbs and the flaxseed in a pan with garlic and olive oil. And then I took out the garlic cloves, added the Parmesan and just mix it all together. So the reason I chose flaxseed is flaxseed, it's a plant-based protein. It's really high in omega-3s and really high in fiber. It has like a nutty flavor. Flaxseed is another thing that I would put in my yogurt in the morning or I put on cereal or I could put in a smoothie. Um, it's pretty versatile. It's just a plant-based protein and it also has the essential fatty acids. So you could even just sprinkle this on a salad in general, but now we're just going to mix it with the breadcrumbs. And we have that. So then our next thing, and I realized afterwards that I forgot to include this in the recipe and I'm so sorry, but we have our chicken and we're gonna, we're gonna spice it up, okay? So I've already cleaned the chicken and I made my spice blend. So this is equal parts onion powder, garlic powder, parsley and smoked paprika. Um, I'm just gonna sprinkle it on both sides of my chicken. Enough just to coat it, but not to go crazy. And again, if you can, you can really choose any spices you like. If you don't, if you're not into parsley, parsley can be polarizing, so you don't have to do the parsley. Um, the paprika, you know, it's powerful, but I think it should be good. And then we just have salt and pepper, which we don't necessarily need, but we're doing it. And we're just gonna get both sides. Um, again, anything, you know, it's your choice. You could use the same kind of spices on shrimp or on plain fish, on tofu. I think if any of you are the vegetarian vegans in the group and you're using tofu, you're probably better at telling the group what the best spices are. <laughs> um, but now here we go. I think for me, this is enough spice to start. And then what we're gonna do, and. Can everyone see my stove? Yeah, we can see it. Okay, good. <laughs> so we'll just let the stove heat up. We have oil. Oh, sorry. If anyone has questions while we're just letting this heat up, you can type them in. I guess we could answer them. Um, oh, it smells good. I'm excited. Is anyone cooking along or is anyone going to try the recipe? Oh, maybe we had some issues getting the recipe. Yeah. So it looks like if folks, if you, um, if you registered today, um, or like late last night, it's possible that we didn't get the recipe out to you because it went out earlier in the day on Friday. So, um, we will send it out. Um, 
Someone is asking, can you use chicken thighs? You can use any protein you want. I chose um, chicken tenders just because they're easier to deal with. <laughs> any protein you guys want, chicken thighs are great. They're extra juicy. So I think another really good choice. Oh, and we did have a question around, can we get an updated recipe with the spices? Sure, I'll definitely send it to you. Um, I can also just tell you what I did. It was equal parts, it was a teaspoon of or onion powder, garlic powder, smoked paprika and parsley. So one teaspoon of each, and I just mixed it together, but I can send out an updated recipe. Thank you. We did have a question around what are the ingredients for dressing again? I believe it was salsa verde and Greek yogurt. Yeah, so the, the listed ingredients were salsa verde and fromage blanc. I couldn't find it in the supermarket. So Greek yogurt is a perfect substitute for fromage blanc. It's slightly more sour, but healthier and tasty. Okay, I think, I think my pan is hot enough. Well, it sounds hot enough. I don't know if you guys can hear it. So now we're just going to let it sear um, like three, four minutes on each side. Um, while we're doing that, I guess we could prep my salad for serving. Um, so here we have a nice salad bowl. Let me get another serving spoon. Maybe you guys can see better like this. So it's really hearty. I think it's gonna definitely keep you full, but mostly green. Now we can add the diced peppers to it, get some extra color and crunch. Sydney, we do have a question that came in. Um, are low calorie sweeteners such as stevia a good alternative to sugar? For weight management, yes. Um, they're calorie free. The reason they're calorie free is that we actually can't digest them. So like we don't absorb them. So you, you taste the sweetness and then they just pass through your system. Um, you know, artificial sweeteners or, or sweeteners like stevia, they're calorie free, which is good, but it's, it's still like an added sweetness that we don't necessarily necessarily need. I would say just try to limit it, you know, one packet in your coffee um, is probably enough. There is some concern over the effect they have on your microbiome. And that's like a new area of research that's really, really getting popular. My personal preference is Splenda just because I understand the science more. And there's there's some questionable research about the stevia plant versus stevia extract. In general, you're never going to be, you're never going to consume enough that it's an issue. So they are generally regarded as safe and they don't result in weight gain. So for weight management, definitely a better alternative to sugar. Thank you. Uh, we do have another question too around, um, I've heard raw kale is harder on the digestive system than cooked kale. Do you recommend sauteing kale as an option? Um, it's definitely harder on the GI tract. Definitely, definitely. If, if it's tough for you, you could totally saute it. I didn't saute it because I want mine to be like cold. Um, you can also substitute any lettuce that you want. If you want to do spinach, arugula, romaine, mixed greens, uh, watercress, anything like that, whatever salad base you want to use is fine. If you do want to use kale, but you're concerned about how hard it is, you can try sauteing it and see if that's better. It's still just as nutritious. Thank you. We're going to flip the chicken, see how we're doing. Ooh. 
So it has a nice brown. It really smells good. I wish you guys could smell it. Um, but it really looks good. I think we're going to almost be ready. I'm just going to show you. We have our salad here going again. I'm going to put in my slice, my pear slices. I think pears are such a good um, salad ingredient. They just the sweetness, the crispiness. It's just great. Oh, wait, we'll go back because now I'm going to add some of these. The breadcrumbs. So, I mean, to me, this is like a very appealing dish. It's super colorful. We have contrast and flavor and texture. It's going to store well if you don't finish it. I need mean, just a few more minutes with the chicken, but I see there are maybe some more questions. Yeah, so Nancy asked if you can include the way you prepared the breadcrumbs and what you used in the, um, yeah, for the updated recipe version. Sure. Um, I, I mean, I can tell you, but then we'll also, I'll send an updated recipe, but the breadcrumbs I use a quarter cup panko breadcrumbs, a quarter cup of the ground flaxseed. So this, and then I had one garlic clove that I just smashed and I put olive oil in a pan such like this, just heated it up. And then I just toasted the garlic with the breadcrumbs and the flaxseed. And I toasted that just like until, you know, you could smell that it was getting very flavorful and like it was starting to brown. And then once it was brown, I poured the breadcrumbs and flaxseed into a bowl, discarded the garlic and added a quarter cup of Parmesan cheese and just mixed it all together. Thank you. Okay, these look good. Okay, I'm just going to slice it and then I'm going to put it on the salad and show you guys what we're working with here, but this is part of why I like the chicken tenders. They just cook very quickly. But everything smells so good. And it was so easy. Cindy, while you're chopping, we have two questions that came in. The first one is, um, what is the best temperature you uh, to cook the chicken if you have an electric stove versus gas? Um, I did it on like medium high heat. Um, if you have a thermometer, you could always just put a thermometer in the chicken. You want the chicken to be at least 165 degrees to know that you're, you know, getting rid of any possible bacteria that could be in it. Thank you. Um, and then we have another quick question around what are your thoughts on goji berries for smoothies, salads, etc.? I've heard they're good for you, but I've also heard that they're bad. Um, it has been a long time since I've looked up goji berries, so I'm not, I'm not so sure. I, th I, I, I would need to get back to you on it. I'm sorry. Okay, thank 
No worries. I think that's perfectly fine. Um, and then we have another question around our probiotics like kefir anti-inflammatory. Um, I know they are good in terms of gut microbiome. Um, going to show you guys the salad because it really looks so good. <laughs> and then I will answer this question. So this looks like a really complete meal to me. You know, the chicken, it's, you could say it's roughly a quarter of the plate. And then we just have carbohydrate in the form of the fruits and vegetables and the breadcrumbs. I think we have a really good crunch. You can see the chicken, you know, it's, it's browned on the outside. So we're gonna get crunch there too, but it's also cooked through. Um, this is what it should look like. So I hope, I hope you guys see how easy it is <laughs> and um, you know, that you're eager to try it as well. In terms of kefir and anti-inflammatory diet, I mean, it's a fermented dairy product. So I do think it would be included in a Mediterranean anti-inflammatory diet. The probiotics are great for your gut. Um, definitely something that you should, or if you already do, continue to include in your diet. Awesome. Thank you so much, Sydney. And that salad does look awesome. Um, I'm not even a meat eater, but it looks amazing. Uh, and so I hope everybody had a great time with this. And uh, again, thank you so much for your time and your uh, just wealth of information. I'm sure we'd like to have you back sometime. Um, and uh, yeah, thank you so much and have a great rest of your weekend, everybody. And have a great rest of your weekend too, Sydney. Thank you guys. Thank you so much for having me. It was honestly a lot of fun. So if you, if you'll have me back, I'll come back and I'll, I'll send you an updated recipe with, you know, all the steps and everything. Awesome. Thank you so much. Have a great weekend guys.